we will go ahead and start to place our design on the cast. We'll start with the clasp assemblies and I like to put a mesial rest. We're going to do an eye bar on the premolar. So we would start with a mesial rest and we're going to prep our teeth. We have a high survey line here and with the eye bar we want to prepare a guide plate that is approximately two millimeters down from the marginal ridge. So I'm preparing my guide plate, moving my survey line down a little bit. I have moved my survey line down to my marg uh, two millimeters below my marginal ridge. So I'm going to also prepare a mesial rest, which I would normally reduce about a millimeter to a millimeter and a half at the marginal ridge and then I would reduce in the fossa enough to have a positive seat where my rest does not my rest um, does not want to slide off or move the tooth in any particular direction at the same time I'm preparing a little sluice way but we have I think positive seat that's not going to fall off. One of my indirect retainers will be on the canine. We cannot place them on the mandibular incisors, so the closest place that we can place an indirect retainer, which we have to have for a Kennedy Class 1 or a Kennedy Class 2. On the Kennedy Class 1 we have two indirect retainers usually, and on that Kennedy Class 2 we might have one indirect retainer. But our indirect retainer is going to be on a distal incisal angle rest, and I am preparing that rest at this point. Um, I want to have a point where this is deeper in, at this portion right here than at this ridge right here. So I think I'll prepare this with this discoid. In the mouth I might be preparing this with a uh, diamond and I would probably be using, I kind of like the tapered diamond to do this and lay it sideways like this just to, to prepare my rest because it helps me get a point deeper here than at the marginal ridge. You also carry this little faucet down the facial of the tooth a little bit and a little bit on the lingual. I'm going to go ahead and color in my rest. My mesial fossa rest here with a little bit of sluice way and the distal incisal angle rest which will be my indirect retainer comes up and over the incisal edge of the tooth. For my framework I'm going to come up and around that distal incisal angle rest comes up over the edge. Now because there's a diastema between those teeth, that rest will come back over and it will come back over here and it will possibly come down like this and then come back up on my premolar because I don't want it visible from the facial. So I'm going to take this around my rest and then we're going to come down and avoid the marginal gingiva by a minimum of three millimeters. I'm going to come back up and this will be my guide plate. Now I'm taking that mistakenly up to the marginal ridge and I don't mean to be doing that. For the eye bar, we prepare a uh, guide plane that's at least two to three millimeters in height from the marginal ridge down the tooth. Then the guide plate is one millimeter above the bottom of that prepared guide plate and it comes forward and comes down the tooth. So this is the guide plate for the eye bar. On the facial surface, I will have my eye bar. The eye bar comes up the facial of the tooth. It 
engages the tooth at that 0.01 undercut, but it goes up to my survey line, or it creates a 2 by 2 millimeter pod that touches the tooth. It doesn't just touch at the very tip of that eye bar. Now that eye bar is going to come back down, and at about the 6 millimeter mark, which I marked on my cast, it makes a rounded right angle and goes posteriorly, and I'll connect the rest of it when I get my uh, base attachment drawn in that area. Alright, we'll go to the other side. Again, we had enough room for the eye bar on both sides, and that's our clasp of choice. So I'm going to prepare my rest seat for the eye bar or for the RPI system, removing about a millimeter to a millimeter half at my marginal ridge, and then preparing a positive seat into the tooth, into that mesial fossa of my premolar. I want to have a positive seat. I don't want my rest to be able to fall off of it. So that's what I have in here. Okay, we do not, we take a sluice way through here. Now, I already prepared that when I did the marginal ridge. We have a sluice way in that area, but we don't take the sluice way through the buccal surface because this is, there's not an arm going through that buccal area. So we would not prepare a sluice way through there. So I have a nice positive seat here. My marginal ridge and my guiding plane back here look pretty good. I have a little bit of a high survey line right here, so I'm going to go ahead and lower my survey line. It really just needs to come down a fraction of a millimeter. But I'm going to prepare my guide plane, and I'm going to resurvey right there, and I've now moved my survey line down to the gingival aspect there. So, we'll go ahead and draw. We have a mesial rest that I prepared right there. And my framework will come around that, will come down. It will avoid the marginal gingiva by a minimum of three millimeters. It will come back up and become my guide plate which, again, I went a little bit high. My guide plate should be one millimeter above my prepared guide plane, and that would make it about two millimeters below the marginal ridge. So I'm going to come along here with my guide plate and come on back down. My guide plate also, remember, comes to where the tooth becomes a little bit smaller and uh, that's to keep the tooth from moving to the lingual when my eye bar flexes into the undercut. So I will have an eye bar coming up here, and it will touch the tooth at that point, and it will go on up to the survey line or two millimeters uh, above the .01 undercut. Comes down, makes a rounded right angle, to go posteriorly and will join my base attachment as soon as I get it. I want to see that .01 undercut on your cast because I can then tell that you went up two to three millimeters above that and sometimes it might go above the survey line but I know that you know you're into your undercut. So I like to see that little red, that little red line right there for the undercut. All right, we need another indirect retainer because here's our fulcrum line. We drop a perpendicular to our fulcrum line and it calls for um, an indirect retainer up here, but since we don't do that, we kind of draw a vector. And our other one would be either the distal incisal angle of the canine, or I like to put it, It's there's not much difference between here and here. I like to put it in the 
uh, mesial fossa of the premolar because there's usually not much occlusion in there and it's not going to interfere with anything whereas the incisal edge we might have to reduce significant amount in order to not have an occlusal interference and again this will have a little bit of a sluice way because it's coming the metal is coming up over this little ridge here so we want to prepare a sluice way in that area too so I have a nice positive seat I think here I'm not going to fall off of it it's not going to want to slip off and I'll mark my indirect retainer right there now I have to get my indirect retainer from this point over to that rest so I'm going to plate it and my plating again is preferably in the middle of the tooth I'm going to keep it right at that survey line and I'm coming around like this now I have chosen to do a lingual plate major connector because the distance between the floor of the mouth, which you can see this frenum attachment right here, the distance between the floor of the mouth and my marginal gingiva is only about um, seven, six to seven millimeters in height. So I don't have enough room to make my bar five millimeters wide and still avoid the marginal gingiva by three millimeters. So I'm going to do a lingual plate. So my lingual plate will come around like this. It covers the cingulum. It goes up to the contact point, covers the cingulum, goes over the, over the um, cingulum up to the contact point, over the cingulum up to the contact point, over the cingulum up to the contact point, over this cingulum, and it comes up and goes right over there for our incisal rest. Our major connector. Our major connector will come down at this line angle right here and it should go basically to the functional floor of the mouth and so I'm going to take it down got a little bit of a torus right there. I'm going to come around join here same way here. I'm going to come down slants backwards just a little bit. I'm going to come around here. This should be five millimeters. I, I didn't make five millimeters so I really sh should lower that a bit. Um, I'm going to put a five right here. This should be three millimeters. This should be five millimeters in width. So I would be taking my major connector down a little bit from there. This one I think is five in here. And three up here. Base attachment. We'll go ahead and draw the the base first. The base is going to come down and join right at that sharp angle that we've created. It's going to come back. It's going to cover. Here's our retromolar pad here. It's going to cover retromolar pad. It's hopefully going into that retromylohyoid fossa, which will give us good retention. Comes back over there and if we have no undercuts it will go down to the depth of our, our buccal vestibule and come up right at this point. Now that will allow us to draw base attachment. The rule for base attachment is that it should be placed two-thirds of the distance to the beginning of retromolar pad usually not to exceed 25 millimeters so we're going to come up two millimeters from the bottom here because we want this acrylic to totally surround our base attachment and we're going to come back and we're going to go about two-thirds of the way back to the beginning of retromolar pad we're going to come across our ridge and we're not going to go too far down the ridge because we might want to butt a tooth up against that ridge in order to get the proper angulation of the denture tooth. So we're going to come through and go back up to our guide plate right there. And then within that area we will prepare our loops. 
or a retentive mechanism basically this is going to help hold on the denture teeth and the base so we're going to come back here and at this point we're coming forward just a little bit and that becomes our processing stop or our tissue stop when we prepare this denture um, the base attachment will be prepared to stand up off the tissues except in this one area it will actually touch our cast and what that does is it prevents this framework from rotating when we pack acrylic resin under there during the processing procedure. Now we have one thing to do over here. We have to place an internal finish line. The, the acrylic will butt up against this major connector but on the inside it will also have a little finish line where the plastic joins the major connector and that is done with a blue pencil with a dotted line. So those are our finish lines for that side. On the other side I'm going to draw that just a little bit differently um, to show you how some people draw a different processing stop. Draw our plastic. Here our plastic is coming down, back. We've got a big old retromolar pad on this one. We're covering retromolar pad. Our uh, acrylic comes back. Usually there's masseters right there so we don't often get to extend way up that area. We come down and it will go back up right at this point here at the distal of the tooth. Our base attachment then we're going to start two millimeters above the bottom border. We want that acrylic to totally surround it. We come back around two-thirds of the distance to the beginning of retromolar pad and some people will place a processing stop like this at this point and we'll come forward and we'll stay just over the crest of the ridge and come on this direction and go right back up to our guide plate with our um, base attachment. Now we're going to have again some loops in there to allow for acrylic resin to lock those teeth and the resin onto the framework. So we'll have one like this, maybe another one. Have I planned for too many? Who knows? I have another opening right there. So there's our base attachment and this is the processing stop right back here for this way of drawing the base attachment and um, we used to color it in so that we know that it touches the tissue. Again, our acrylic joins the major connector right here so we have an internal finish line where we have a little internal butt joint for the plastic to join the major connector on both sides of it. We can attach our eye bar and as it comes back toward this direction it gets a little larger wider back here and then it gets skinnier as it comes forward. It usually joins this at a position where there's a bar across here so that when it casts up it will cast adequately in that area. And here's our eye bar joining right back here also. Okay, I'm going to change these lines just a little bit. So our eye bar will come back and join right about here. Gets a little wider is what I'm trying to show back in this spot. And our eye bar comes back and joins right about there. There's really no need for that line there because it's kind of joins the base attachment right there. So we don't really have a line as such right there. Our eye bar, this is the RPI system. Mesial rest, distal guide plate, eye bar, 
Flip on the lingual, the reciprocal component is a combination of this minor connector and the guide plate, keeping that tooth from moving to the lingual. We talk about if we talk about what um, our design choices are. Our first choice is the eye bar. Probably our second choice would be the wrought wire. Third choice would be either that modified T-bar or the reverse circlet clasp. The reverse circlet clasp that comes from the mesial and grabs the distofacial with a cast circumferential clasp would not be a choice on the maxillary in the premolar area as it would be very unesthetic. The contraindications to use of the eye bar are if the analyzing rod shows that that bar would have to stand out greater than 1.5 millimeters at that 6 millimeter junction down below the marginal gingiva, if it has to stand out more than 1.5 millimeters we wouldn't use the eye bar. And it might stand out because of undercuts in the bony area, positioning of the tooth that may lean to the buckle, or a very bulbous tooth would all make that bar stand out too far and would contraindicate the use of a bar. The other thing that would is if we have a real active frenum attachment in this area. When the patient moves his lip, this floor uh, buckle vestibule rises and scrapes along the bottom of that bar. It can be very irritating to the patient. The other reason we would not use an eye bar would be if we don't have a 0.01 mid-facial undercut or very slightly to the mesial. Then we, that would preclude us from using the eye bar and we'd try to find some other clasping mechanism that fits our undercut design.